the world is changing at an amazing pace. If you think about uh, the impact of the iPhone and the way it's changed, the way we stay connected, the way we operate, the way um, everyone from professionals down through kids, if anyone here has kids, you know, try around the holidays to find gifts and all they want are apps or another Apple device. Um, it's fundamentally changed the way people live. It's eliminated industries. It's changed the toy business. It, it has changed so much about the world. You look at the way Google has changed the way people source information, the way companies advertise, the way industries now are targeted and built around some of Google innovations. You look at how Uber has changed the way people travel and it's just the beginning. You know, there is a vision for anyone who, who really has studied Uber where 10 years from now, the vision is half of us don't have cars anymore and you're just Ubering around. Um, and you think about the implications from an environmental standpoint, the implications from an indi from industry standpoint, from automotive, a host of different aspects of the world change. That's the last 10 years. You think about the changes that are on the horizon, some of which we almost can't anticipate, but you think about 3D printing and the impact that it's having and could have on global manufacturing and the, the amount of plants and people that would become redundant if, in fact, companies can figure out, as some have started, how to actually manufacture product through a 3D printer. Uh, you think about some of the developments in healthcare, where in cancer research, doctors today are able to do, use 3D printing to understand what cancer is doing to the human body so that they could actually treat cancer through 3D printing. Uh, Google loons, where they're putting internet all over the world into countries where they haven't had computers, they haven't had internet. Uh, you know, and the list goes on and on, and you think about the, the changes in the last two years in the automotive industry, where you know, it, five years ago we were talking about whether we'd give up our loud engines for, for battery because it was environmentally friendly, now we're talking about driverless cars. Uh, and in fact, if anyone here has a Tesla, they, they drive on their own essentially. Um, and the automotive industry will change more in the next five years than in the last 60 years, period. Um, and so the, the amount of change we've seen in the last 10, 20 years has seemed almost overwhelming at times. And yet on an annual basis, we think that, and I think most of us would agree, that that change is just going to start to become exponential every year. And so it, that has a, a profound impact on what, le what we look for in leaders. It has a profound impact on skills and muscles that leaders need to develop. Um, you know, we talk about, and, and some of the research that we've done is around this concept of ripple intelligence. So five years ago, if we were here talking, uh, we probably would have had a bullet that said the best CEOs can see around the corner and the best heads of HR can see around the corner. Nowadays, if you can see around the corner, you're probably getting passed by four other things that are coming in different directions and you don't even know it. And so this concept of ripple intelligence, if you imagine throwing a, a stone into a pond, it becomes a bit of an early warning system for a CEO where they start to think about issues, challenges, uh, changes in the market at, based on context. And they, they, they can see the ripples and the best leaders can kind of understand what those ripples mean. Are they situational? Are they game changing? Are they major attackers? Now imagine that same lake with 15 stones thrown in. And the best leaders can understand where are the ripples hitting each other and which are the ones that I really need as a CEO, head of HR, head of recruiting. Where do I need to start putting resources, putting capital to anticipate those challenges, those changes, and get the, move, the, the business moving in that direction? Again, profoundly, fundamentally different than what we would have expected of a leader or a CEO even five years ago. Thrive in a VUCA world. You know, the military has used the concept of VUCA for 30 years, and it was a battlefield idea that the world is, you know, there's volatility, there's uncertainty, it's chaotic, there's, it's complex, it's, uh, it's ambiguous. Now, they used to train Navy SEALs to deal with that. Now we say any business leader needs to operate under that type of chaos and uncertainty. And part of the challenge, which we'll get into as we go, is if you think about how the typical leader grows to be a CEO, grows to be a head of HR, grows to be a head of recruiting, we're not really teaching them how to do that. Um, you might be exposed in a small little microcosm of where you are in the company, but some of these are, are, are new muscles and their survival skills that aren't really being taught in companies, which is frankly, as we go through this, it's part of the opportunity for people here in the room. Um, a CEO today has to lead with vision and purpose. It can't just be, we have shareholders, we need a return, let's go build a better widget. 
It now needs to be something that inspires the employee base, that inspires investors. The average CEO used to be able to run command and control. They had shareholders, they had employees, maybe, the, and you know, in theory, they had customers. Now they have social groups that have a point of view. They have activist groups that have a point of view. They, you know, more and more companies are starting to have activist investors stepping in. Even companies that are growing beautifully, someone has a vision for change. And so if you're not leading through purpose and vision, if you're not being your own authentic self, a CEO can no longer be an over-varnished, you know, made-for-TV executive. They have to lead with authenticity because if not, between social media, between the 24-7 access and exposure that the rest of the world has, you can't be the business CEO one day and then be a totally different person when you're on, at home on the weekend because that lack of authenticity will be exposed in a matter of days. And they need to move fast. Um, the world is changing so quickly again. You think about our CEO um, loves to talk about the Uber example, that three years ago it didn't exist. Today it's a $70 billion or $60 billion market cap company. Companies used to think in terms of three, five, eight year plans. Eight years from now, no one can envision what the world is going to look like. If you're thinking in terms of, well, we're going to build this strategy, we'll execute in three years, in five years, you're done. By the time you're getting to five-year strategy, you probably have 30 new competitors, five new attackers, and your industry is getting consolidated or going away. Strength, and which goes to strengthening the core, embrace disruption. Companies today, leaders need to be thinking about what is my core business, who are my core employees, how are we making money, what is our core, you know, what is our business today, and then what are the various attackers that some might be noise, others might be real, that are going to fundamentally transform the industry. Five years ago, if you were sitting in Detroit, you probably thought this crazy little technology company in California that wanted to do battery-operated cars was a little bit of a noisy distraction. And today, Tesla and GM are fighting, literally in a fight for survival, to see which one of them can get their battery-operated car for the masses out, whether it'll be late 17, early 18. And whoever wins probably wins that sector for the next 10 years. Uh, and there might be some other new entrant that no one's ever heard of that's going to that's gonna try to beat them. And so it, it is critical for leaders at every level to be thinking that way. What does that all mean to HR? We talked about the fact that the role of, of leadership has changed. The average CEO, and even when we're frankly involved, 60 plus, almost 70% of CEOs end up being grown and developed internally. And so as a company is watching the development of their leaders, um, and the head of HR is helping the board and the CEO with a succession plan, which it used to be done by the CEO on a napkin, maybe with the board over a cocktail. Now the head of HR needs to actively be driving this, working with their talent leadership, working with the board to think about, as you go back to the prior slide, the CEO role has changed. You need, the CEO needs to be much more human than in the past. They need to be seen as approachable. They need to be empathetic. They need to be able to see, you know, they need to have developed ripple intelligence. How does HR help get the leaders there? How do they make sure the next CEO is going to be ready and developed? We've, it's, be, it's cliche to talk about how the CEO is the loneliest role in the world, but with everything happening out there, it is materially more, more lonely and difficult than it was even five years ago. Um, when, we did, when our team did the CEO report and we interviewed 150 CEOs, and these are CEOs of the biggest and best and most successful companies in the world, somewhere north of 80% said they worry every day if they can do their job. And there's a vulnerability that they have had to come to accept that they're just not sure they're ready for the job that they're in. Think about that in the context of your company, your CEO. Most of the time we think of these leaders as larger than life. There was a time where we viewed CEOs as the heroes. And now most are saying, I'm not sure I'm capable of doing the job I'm in today. It's a pretty scary proposition. HR needs to be thinking about how are we finding and developing those great leaders for the future? How are we trying to identify who on our teams possesses those unique skills? And then how do we harness them to get them ready to step up? Guide the CEO and the board through the VUCA world. We talked about how lonely it is. The best heads of HR are there sitting side by side with the CEO, with the leadership team. They have, you know, the best heads of HR, we have long said, have a degree of confidence and judgment. They have judgment on people. They have judgment on business. The best ones are able to even help further look at the ripples and help make sure that the leadership team and the board are focused on the right ones. Leveraging the right data to support the decision, the decision making. For anyone who was in this room the last hour and heard what Salesforce was doing from an analytics standpoint, 
What was really interesting was I didn't one time hear her talk about cost per hire. I didn't hear her talk about days to fill. I didn't hear her talk about recs to per recruiter. They're talking about we need to grow the business, where are new markets where we can move the company if need be to bring in the resources we need because we need salespeople to grow. Those are the, the new conversations that heads of HR and heads of TA need to be having with the business leaders to help the business get to the other side. Because every one of our businesses, as great as Google is, as great as Salesforce is, as great as Tesla is, as great as Hydric is, there are companies that are coming for our lunch. And so HR's job is to figure out how do you bring the right data to make sure that as Salesforce, as she talked about before, they couldn't get enough engineers here. It's where their, their headquarters, where they're founded. But okay, Boston, we have better access to the market. It's unfettered. Let's open up an office in Boston and we could grow that way. Those are the kinds of analytics that business leaders, CEOs, and boards, now they're not yet expecting it because so few companies are delivering it. But in a few years, and I'm not sure if it's a couple of years, five years, boards and CEOs are going to be demanding it. And from a TA and HR perspective, I just caution you, if in two years you're walking into the CEO and you're talking about cost per hire, they're going to ask you to leave the office because the average CEO doesn't care. As they're thinking about those obstacles on their plate and those, those challenges that are coming and those disruptive forces, they don't care if they spend an extra $2,000 on a hire. They don't care if they have to wait. And I mean, they, they care, but they won't really care if they have to wait a couple of weeks. What they want is are they getting the right hire? Are they getting that, the supreme talent that are going to help them navigate into the next world? And two years, five years, eight years later, have you delivered the right talent? that are growing in the company and that are helping them achieve the vision for the, the business and, and, and keep it moving in the right direction. Grow the leaders, you know, HR's job should be and always will be identifying the best leaders internally and externally. And then focus on accelerating performance. Again, and Jory will speak more to this as we go, but it's all about are we moving fast enough? When we talk to our clients, the two questions that we're specifically when we're talking to CEOs that we always are asking is, is your team moving fast enough and is your team aligned? And almost to a, to a person, when we have that conversation, the answer to one of those two questions is no. And it's either my team's not moving quick enough or my team's not aligned. And generally speaking, if it's a no to they're not aligned, they can't be moving fast enough. But you know, and again, Jory will talk through a lot of the research around their profound impact on, on fo individuals and teams at every level of an organization. It can't just be that the CEO and the leadership team are moving really fast, because if the head is moving fast and the body isn't, you, you know, the head is a block down the road. And this one is important in, in the work that, that I personally do in the HR space. We have this conversation a lot. The idea of HR as the people people has gone the way of the dinosaur. And if, you st if there are still pockets of it, it needs to go the way of the dinosaur. Um, the reality is the best heads of HR, in fact, are thinking about being champions of culture. They're thinking about being advocates for the employees. They're thinking about how do you enable your, your, perform your employees to perform at the optimal level, but you're not sitting there worrying about the people issues. You're not planning the company picnic. You're not, you're not doing those, those you know, smaller impact issues and you're not talking about, well, we're the people people, so we need to fight and defend. That model is dead. Impact on talent acquisition. As we think about where the world is going, you know, if you, if you go back to the sixth break, I know we kept trying to cut one of the breakout sessions off. But if you think about the breakout sessions before, we were talking about employee branding. We're talking about um, you know, hiring manager experience. We're talking about everything internally and externally where recruiting is the brand ambassador. And so if, you're gonna, if we're going to compete, if we're going to deliver the talent that our CEOs are demanding and that our, the businesses need, it can't just be a one, it can't be a one-pronged approach. It needs to be leveraging digital in every possible way. It's leveraging the recruiters of the world. It's leveraging every available technology in order to deliver for the business. Again, more on uh, digital. It's understanding, you know, nowadays it's easy for people to have a great looking resume. Um, most resumes start to look alike. You go in, you're recruiting in Atlanta, and everyone at one point worked for SunTrust Bank, Chick-fil-A, and you can kind of go through the list. You recruit in Boston, and you see Putnam, Fidelity, EMC. I mean, it, it's, it's hard to actually look at four different resumes and see anything unique. The best heads of TA, the best recruiters, are going to be the ones who understand how do you leverage every single resource available to you to figure out who's authentic, who's great, and who isn't. 
Focus on data-driven decision-making in every step of the process. We talked about, I referenced the Salesforce meeting and the analytics around opening new offices and emphasizing where they hire from and which, which, which you know, uh, new hires have been more successful based on their backgrounds. But it's also moving into psychometric testing. It's moving into different analytic-based assessment tools to make sure that you're reducing some of the risk and increasing the likelihood that as a company you're bringing the best talent into the organization. And then thrive in a fast-paced, hyper-competitive world. If the CEO is living in a pants-on-fire universe, which means the head of HR and all, the board and the leaders are, are living in that environment, talent acquisition has to be, frankly, moving one step quicker. What, again, from the, the CEO report, this just gives you a little bit of playing on the theme. But if you look through, I, I won't read all 10, I'll let you read, but you, know, you, you look at it, uh, Mary Barra, the CEO of General Motors, I believe the auto industry will change more in the next five to 10 years than in the past 50. Larry Page of Google, I'd rather make the mistake of moving too fast than make no mistakes and move too slow. Larry Fink, best at BlackRock, the most successful financial services firm in the world. I don't care if the whole industry blew up, our job is to do better than the industry. Everything is about how do we just move? How do you move fast? How do you execute? And how do you make sure that you're willing to take some, make some mistakes, but you're not making them by sitting around doing nothing? Um, so accelerating change. What's the impact um, on talent? What is the impact on the work that each of you do? Uh, we hire individuals. Yet the reality is they work in teams. You, we don't hire teams unless you're the unique uh, Wall Street the financial recruiter where you do a team lift out of a fixed income tra trading group or an equities trading group. But the reality is we all hire individuals. And then we put them into teams. So fast moving teams and, and accelerating teams, they mobilize quickly, they execute, uh, they transform, they experiment and innovate like your company CEO has, has experimented and innovated in one, one particular line of business. And then uh, you need to spot opportunities and threats and you need to respond quickly to each of them. Make sense? So when we think about a model for uh, uh, anticipating performance and anticipating uh, 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 capabilities in an individual, we think in terms of these dimensions. How do you mobilize? How do you execute? How do you transform? How agile are you? And then hence, how, how does that impact the entire team suite? Change is happening fast. Look at, the, look at these statistics, it's, it's, it's incredible. This is university grants and, and, um, and the, 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 the number of grants and the, uh, over time, you can see that the, it, just, it just exploded. Uh, technology ad, uh, adoption. How many years does it take to reach 50 million users? Um, radios, 38 years. Television, 13. Um, handheld devices, four. Computers, three. Facebook, one. And Twitter, eight months. I mean, that's extraordinary. How do you build a business that's sustainable? How do you build a workforce that's sustainable when, you, when, you're, when this rapid change is, 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 is underway in, in all of our organizations? Internet monetizations. Uh, top 15 companies, 1995, right? It's, it's extraordinary number, 16 billion, 2014, 2.4 trillion. Some have lost a little bit of market cap over the past couple of months, but nonetheless, it's still a big number. Um, you move on, China's growth. China was the big growth story, but look at the trend. Look at that transition. Um, how does that impact um, how we operate in the markets in, we, in which we operate? How does it Im impact the way in which we operate globally? European financial stability. Any of, the, any of your firms and most of, you, most of the bigger companies here have European businesses. We have European business, and we all know the story of Europe over the past number of years. Thankfully, this year, it looks like we're seeing a little stability there. We hope that it changes over time. But these are the things that impact all of us. And comp com this is the most interesting statistic based upon research that we've done. Company longevity in the S&P 500. Uh, in 1935, the longevity was 90 years. That's a lifetime. That's actually more than a lifetime. <laughs> um, 2014, 18 years. So companies grow, change, and those who flourish over time have the ability to be agile and have the ability to accelerate performance at the individual level, at the team level, and at the organizational level. Today we're gonna to just talk a little bit about the team level and, and how that happens. There you got the world, you got the industries. Here's what's happening at multiple levels across the globe. 2025, 46 of the global top 200 cities in the world will be in China. Uh, industry, um, a, a move towards service-related industries will continue to grow compared to uh, manufacturing employment over time. People are more concerned about sustainable uh, entities, sustainable roles, increased societal push for greener operations across the whole supply chains. 
if you look at the, at the company level, the demographics and career structures for employees, which is really the concern of all of you, all of us in this room, that changing, uh, for employ uh, uh, changing, forcing companies to totally revamp their workforces, totally think about their approaches to talent, both uh, acquire acquisition of talent, onboarding of talent, development of talent, selection of talent over time, and know how to uh, uh, go through the life cycle of an employee within an organization to also know when you need to counsel them out. So it's a different world in which we're operating. You know, the cradle to grave raise world was a long, long time ago when we've all lived through that, that, that transition. Now it's, it's even, we're operating at that much higher speeds. So acceleration helps companies, teams, and leaders win. No big surprise there. I don't think it's a big, uh, you know, it's a lot of words on this slide, but basically, um, accelerating firms grow 37% faster than those who aren't accelerating, and they generate 30% higher profits. Teams are, are, engined, are the engines of acceleration, and accelerating teams deliver uh, more, uh, higher, higher, higher results. On, on average, 23% more productivity. Um, and the single business driver for acceleration, as Dan mentioned before, is the quality of leadership. People want to belong, you want vision, purpose, you want to be part of a mission, you want to be part of a journey, and you want to be totally bought into that. And that really drives acceleration within teams. Accelerating teams deliver more value. That's, that's clear. If you look at, if you look at this, uh, this, this particular, it's a busy slide. So what's, what this tells you is a couple things. Those teams who are closest to customers and closest to where the action is, get, you know, they're, they're moving quickly because every day, they're dealing with, with the world at large and they understand the impacts on their, on their business, the impacts on the, on the products and things that they're developing, and the impacts upon the performance of the individuals within those organizations. At the top, it's a little, little trickier. Um, there's a little bit more disconnection at the top. Um, and again, in, in, in companies where, um, where you have the highest performing teams and the highest performing leadership, you, get to, you do get better results at the top. But the top tends to be more disconnected than the bottom. And, and, and it's an interesting uh, uh, set, of, set of statistics here. And if you actually look at it, it's a pretty big sample size of, 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 of research that we've done there. So you know, 311, uh, 311 directors and above, lo look at the difference in those teams that are accelerating, those things, teams that are moving, those teams that are lagging, and those teams that are derailing. It's pretty strong numbers and pretty compelling uh, data that would suggest that team performance, team acceleration is what makes a difference in, 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 in an organization at large. Again, we hire individuals, but we operate in teams. And effective team, teaming is, probably, is a big differentiator between innovation, between performance, between how, amongst how you go to market and amongst what you deliver in terms of value to the enterprise at the revenue level, the shareholder level, and, uh, and in terms of margin growth. So what companies do to accelerate? One, they mobilize, they think customer first. Two, they think simple. Three, they transform, they innovate over time, and, um, and hence they, they drive agility and they become more agile in, 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 in uh, they become a learning machine, they, be, they, be, they, they, they iterate to perfection, uh, and they drive outcomes in a much more deliberate, much more accelerated manner, and, and, and that's what they do. Um, winning capabilities, you know, we talk about talent, is a big piece of the talent agenda, be a talent magnet, become distinguished for your investment in people. You, uh, we heard multiple conversations about the investment in talent and the growth of pe people, and think of business units as guests and not family. Now, that's an interesting set of words there. What does that mean? When you're guest, you're there for a moment in time. Uh, when you're family, for better or for worse, you're there forever. <laughs> and so I think it's important when you think about teaming and accelerating performance within an organization, recognize that those teams are there as guests. They're there for projects. They're, for, they're there for a period of time. And then they disband and go off and become parts of other teams. What do you watch out for? How do you do, what are the big derailers of performance? Number one is clearly risk-averse cult culture, having organizational silos, um, uh, you know, if you, uh, unclear strategic priorities, an inability to balance quality and speed. And these are things that really are derailers of, in terms of team performance and things that I think as you as HR professionals, again, at every level of, of, of uh, or, uh, organization and, and talent that you, that, you, that you interact with, these are the things that you need to keep in mind as you're working within your own team, but as, actually as you're observing and guiding other teams and how they get assembled. What's the impact on talent? And this is the whole punchline here. And Dan, if you want to join, because we'll take a little Q&A here, it'll be great. As you think about your own roles, you know, and you think about maximizing your influence on the talent journey, 
you need to keep in mind that when you're looking at talent and you're thinking about it, we're now in a new war for talent. It's a very different war for talent than the war for talent of 20 years ago, the documented work that McKinsey had done with, with others. You know, we, we, uh, you, you think about firms, all, all of our companies, our company, Hydrogen Struggles, is thinking about how do we create a digital experience for all of our constituents, our clients, our candidates, each other. When you think about that whole digital experience, you think about companies transforming in, in, in the use of technology and their distribution channels, it's a new workforce. You talk to any business leader, and we talk to many, and you ask them honestly, how many people do you think in your organization are going to make that journey with you? And the answer is 50%, and that's kind of optimistic. So what does that mean with the other 50%? Well, half of that other 50%, you could retool, you could retrain, and the other half of that, the 25% that are left, up, left over, are going, to, you know, are going to probably be doing different things than being in part of your organization. Those will be the, 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 the jobs that you're going to have to replace. So it's really important to understand that we're in a really important new world for talent. You need to look for people who are community builders. And you need to build into your assessments and, and methodologies and capabilities. How do you identify p those people who could be parts of teams, who would have a natural affinity for building communities, building relationships, not only inside the company, but outside the company? I think the other piece that's um, you know, particularly important as we think about globalization and we talk about all of our companies being global, you need people who are global citizens. Not, not that they have a passport. I, I, I had a client that always said, listen, get me somebody who's global but it doesn't mean that they have a passport and know where Heathrow Airport is. It means that they understand how to operate in a multicultural, multinational, global world, and how do you operate seamlessly within that, within, within that context. And I think the other two things that are really important when you think about your jobs, when you think about our jobs, it's all about risk managing talent. Um, you know, our clients want to have us really un help them grow their organizations through bringing in new, new leaders um, at every level. Um, top leaders, direct reports to top leaders, and then others through the, through, through the food stack. And they, they, want us, they, they want us to help them manage the risk of that talent. The acquisition of that talent, the uh, duration, durability of that talent over time, and the fungibility of experience and capability that will allow them to grow and do other things inside the organization. And I think we heard of really, I think one of the breakouts talked about being brand ambassadors. I don't remember what the exact uh, two concept was, simple and what was that hand movement? <laughs> I thought it was pretty interesting actually. But uh, the punchline to that is we all are brand ambassadors. When we represent our clients in the market, we represent them as, as a brand in the marketplace. And we need to, we need to be, reflect that brand in the marketplace. When each of you are in your respective roles and you're um, uh, out in the marketplace recruiting talent, you're brand ambassadors for your organization. And you need to make sure that, and we need to make sure that we have that you know, front and center because that experience at every level of, uh, of an employee's um, uh, uh, contact with the organization uh, either denies that brand or, or, or ratifies that brand. So that's what we think about the impact on talent. We try to connect this to things that would be on your mind. And I, I know that most of this group doesn't, isn't recruiting CEOs and, uh, and C-suite executives, but the applicability of this work and the apl applicability of the models and how we think about this work you know, really does go up and down the food chain. And so whether it be an individual contributor who one day will be part of a bigger team, whether it be a, you know, a, 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 a level two leader uh, who, will be, who comes in and will be a manager of a team, you need to be thinking about how do you accelerate the performance of the, of the team, how do, you, how do you maximize the impact of the individual within, your, within the context of your organization. With that, Dan, I'll take any questions. So when you look at the organizations that you guys work with and those top leaders, so many of them are going to be retiring in five to ten years, right? There's going to be a huge exiting um, of those individuals. What are you guys seeing as the, are, are the companies doing to get ready for that when you're talking about the speed and the agility when we can't necessarily predict what any industry is going to look like in 2020, like, even though we talk about the CEO 2020, CFO 2020. So how do we get ourselves and the talent ready for that inevitability of what is going to happen when those top leaders exit? I think there's a couple of things there. I'll take, take a crack at it, Dan, and you jump in as well. Look, I think the historical view of growing leaders was tenure. Time and role drove capability. Today, that's not the case. I mean, think about the 
And we do a lot of work with the uh, uh, World Economic Forum and the Young Global Leaders Program. We actually do the assessment work for the YGL. And what's interesting there is that these are people from all walks of life, but they're all, the requirement is under 40 and a high impact player. Whether it's in the arts, whether it's in, the, in, in uh, education, whether it's in corporate life, whether it's in government, whether it's in uh, uh, um, industry at large. And what's interesting about that is that you know, every year there's a new crop of uh, the, and the, and the group under 40 leaders. And the point is, is that they, we put them into stretch jobs. So tenure used to be the driver of readiness for the next level. Now it's putting people into different, different stretch roles and testing them and, and, and then de determining who of that group can indeed be the next leader in the organizations. I think you'll find that companies are going to be doing more work around development, more work around you know, rigorous succession planning at every level. The succession planning used to mean succession planning for the CEO role. Now it's succession planning. I can't tell you how many times we're brought into many leadership roles, N minus one, N minus two level roles where you know, you'll have a couple of people inside the company, the potential successors, you know, but, and, and then the marketplace, and the point is you want to drive to the optimum by, 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 by employing best practices in succession planning. Dan, what would you add to that? Yeah, so to Jory's point, I'll give you one example. We have a, a client in New York um, that four or five, it's a world-class organization, world-class board CEO and head of HR. Uh, four or five years ago, succession planning meant sitting down with the board and saying, who's the CEO? And were he to be hit by the Guinness truck, do we have someone li lined up behind him? And then they were really innovative four years ago when they decided to also look at four of his direct reports. Now, every year, every quarter, the board goes to the top 300 people in the company and does a full-fledged review. At one point during the course of the year, the entire board meets with every one of the top 300 people. So they'll take around, around a board meeting, they'll take three or four days and bring people in. And so you have an organization where they're looking at, okay, five years out, what is our leadership bench? And you're talking about an organization that, you know, it's a 28,000 person company. So 300 is a pretty deep, you know, it's a pretty deep drill down of leaders. There are others that are starting to wake up and start doing the same thing. Um, to your point, from a myopic HR perspective, um, we look at this data all the time, and I wish I had it with, I should have anticipated that good of a question. Um, but we did a study last year, and in the Fortune 100, the average head of HR was 59 years old. Um, there were more over 65 than under 45. Um, there were more over 70 than under 40. And we looked at the data and said, over three years, there is going to be a retirement boom of heads of HR in the Fortune 100. We then looked to the Fortune 1000, and it gets a little bit better, but not much. And we started to figure out internally, what does this mean? What does this mean from an HR standpoint? Readiness of talent, GE, Pepsi aren't developing their Honeywell. They're not developing the pools of talent the way they used to. Um, what does it mean for the HR profession? And since we started to track that data, there have been 24 heads of HR in the Fortune 100 who have retired. And there are so most were people that we had flagged. A couple were on the younger end. Um, and we're starting to see it now sprinkle through to the Fortune 1000. And the reality is, the good news for us, it keeps us busy. The bad news is there's not enough talent behind it. Um, and so it is, a, it is a, a phenomenon that there isn't quite an answer for. Uh, I think you'll see companies taking a bet. And out here, it, it's frankly more commonplace than in the rest of the country. Uh, but out here, to see a 30-something head of HR or even CEO isn't, isn't that outrageous. In New York, they think the board lost their mind. Um, but we, I do think we are going to start to see, and we're seeing it already, younger, you know, younger high flyers being, in, being given the opportunity to, for, as Jory said, big step-up roles. But even we're starting to see CHROs being minted that, uh, you know, with 12 years of experience, we're seeing people coming in from the outside. Um, but you're right, it is a phenomenon that there isn't quite an answer for yet. Yeah. And if you actually look at the number of co clients that come into us, again, up and down the, 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 uh, the organizational stack, uh, for we, you know, we think we want to enter into this market, we think we have a couple of candidates inside side that could help us get there, we need, need you to help us scope the market, let us know what the competition's doing, uh, give us some insights in the talent, and by the way, we want to look inside and outside for those roles. So those are the kinds of things that we see companies doing today, and we'll see more of that, and there's many, many other examples. Hi, thanks so much. Thanks for making the trip out, too. So, 
Amongst your clients, who have you found to have the most progressive HR? Sorry, I'm Chris Snodgrass with Norwest Venture Partners. We love Jeff Sanders and Mary Saxon, and <laughs> we love retaining you guys on searches Good. all the time in our portfolio. Uh, again, wondering from your perspective, and especially Dan, you work with these CHROs uh, all the time, obviously. Who, which companies or which clients have had, again, the more progressive HR, and then on top of that, do you think that's because the CEO is pushing down that philosophy, or is it due to bringing in a really progressive CR CHRO who then got CEO buy-in? Great, great questions. Uh, and I'll take the second one first, because it's actually, uh, it's a really profound question. And I'll tell you, three years ago, we, were, we had our board HR institute in New York, and we had five of the legendary heads of HR sitting on the, on the dais talking about what world class looks like. And at one point, it hit me, and I asked the group, you know, one had been Jack Walsh's partner, one had been A.G. Laffley's HR partner, one had been Herb Ellison's HR partner, one had, uh, you know, Rico at, at Pepsi. Uh, and I said, well, let me ask you, could any of you have been half the, per the professional you were if you didn't have the CEO demanding it? And the reality is, it is a bit of a chicken and egg. No matter how good the head of HR, if the CEO doesn't have the appetite, if the CEO isn't willing to let the head of HR be in that trusted, privileged, advisor, consigliere type role and add broader value, they, they, frankly, they'll leave, but they can't add the value. So you, actually, you need both a great CEO and a mediocre head of HR. You're not going to see anything special. Uh, it really does need to be that unique, um, that unique partnership of uh, progressive CEO who gets it, progressive head of HR who gets it. Um, no, please. Uh, companies that, that we think are doing really progressive work, um, at a large scale, you can't talk about great HR nowadays without talking about some of the work that Amex is doing around succession planning, around developing high potential leaders, around uh, building muscle in the organization and mobility. Um, the, I, I, the client that I referenced, and this is now public, I'm not violating any confidences, uh, but that client I referenced where they're now driving 300 deep into their succession is BlackRock. And they just, their head of HR is very anti-publicity, uh, keeps a low profile, and yet last year an HBR case was written about some of their innovation around succession planning, talent management. Um, they went out, we helped them bring in a, kind of an arsenal of the biggest, best, world-class talent leaders, and he kind of stocked his team with uh, heads of talent, f four or five of the best heads of talent from other great companies, and just the board said, innovate, do what no one else has ever done. Here's $80 million, go do world class. And, and they have done world class in almost any way. Um, they took their head of talent, who's terrific, made him the head of business partners, um, and then moved him back and put all business partners underneath him. And now um, when a recruiter or a business partner is going to meet with any, business, any client, they're coming with a talent person, a recruiter, and a generalist who have all been, who have all been steeped in talent. So every decision that gets made whether it's an employee relations decision or other, is done through the lens of what is our long-term talent strategy. Um, ironically, I hope I'm not offending anyone in the, in the room, but um, you wouldn't necessarily think of Sears Kmart as an innovative company the last five, six years. Uh, but in HR, in the, when Dean Carter was running it and David Works before him, uh, they did some really world-class things on how do you develop leaders on a shoestring budget, how do you develop leaders under fire, uh, each of them have gone to other firms. D uh, Dean is at Patagonia, David's at Windstream, and they've brought some great practices to each of them. Um, MetLife is starting to do some interesting work on how do you develop leaders at scale, and they're Fortune 5, and uh, you know, there's, a, there's, a ho there's a slew of them, but you know, Workday is starting to do some really interesting work, success factors on the analytics, uh, uh, I mean, uh, Salesforce on the analytics side, um, but those are the ones that jump top of mind. Yes, and five years ago, 10 years ago, financial services HR was a wasteland. Jory has spent a lot more time. Jory, had, for a long time, has been one of the go-to search people in financial services and banking. Um, from an HR standpoint, it was the place you had to go if you had no choice. Um, but now, you know, Kevin Cox at Amex is, is one of, Kevin's probably the best head of HR today at American Express, has been there for a long time. And you could argue that Amex is as much a consumer company as it is tech. Um, but there has been this, you know, if you think about the last 10 years when uh, after the meltdown in 07, the government kept, came in, there's been so much regulation. I know there's a SunTrust team here that can relate to this. There's so much regulation that you, if HR isn't innovating and isn't thinking about how do we develop our people differently and how do we create more of an internal competitive advantage to either retain or attract, you're just going to, you know, government-run organization to some extent. 
And so MetLife got very aggressive. They brought in Franz Haikoop out of Pepsi, who's one of the best. Um, Jeff Smith came from actually Time Warner. He was out here at BGI and then through the acquisition went to BlackRock. And so you suddenly have some world-class heads of HR that were not, that are, that, that they're be far better than their predecessors. Well, first of all, thank you very much for sharing all this information. It's very enlightening. So you have been mentioning a, a little bit of the most important challenges of HR in light of the future. But if you have to point out the one single most important competency required for a successful CHRO, what competency would be that? Um, it's a great question. Uh, so first of all, our view is the CHRO of the future is more likely sitting in this room than sitting in some comp room today. Um, having the, under, the talent chops to understand what good looks like, how to develop talent, how to attract talent is, in general, I would say if there's a muscle to harness, that's it. Um, and as, I, as we look at the last 100 CHRO placements we've done, uh, I think four had a comp background. Most of the rest came through talent at one point. Um, but to the specific question on competency, it's probably an, in, uh, an, uh, an intrinsic ability more so than a competency. Um, when we're talking to CEOs, and oftentimes heads, uh, CEOs will come to us, and, and it's amazing how consistent this is, and either they will acknowledge that they've never seen great HR, oftentimes they'll come in and say, I've heard there's I know there's better because I'm on a board and they just went through a search, or um, my friend is a CEO and what, what she gets from her head of HR is different than what I get, um, or we'll hear, I know there has to be better than what I have, but I don't know what it looks like. And so a, most of our conversations with CEOs are actually educating them on what HR is supposed to be and what their expectations should be from the role. And I talked a bit ago about the courage and judgment concept. We tell CEOs every day, ideally your head of HR is one of the smartest people in the room. And most of the people that I cited to answer that question, Kevin Cox, Jeff Smith, are viewed by their CEO as one of the two or three smartest leaders in the companies. And these are brilliant, brilliant people. Um, but you don't actually need to be brilliant to be a great head of HR. You have to have the best judgment of anyone in the room. So when the CEO is holding a meeting and the CEO walks out feeling like they nailed it, the head of HR, Ken Carrig at SunTrust does this well, others, has to be the one who can walk into the CEO's office, close the room and say, listen, I know you think everyone's on board. These two people actually think you're, what you're saying doesn't make sense. They're not bought in, they're afraid to say it to you. Um, or you have a blind spot, you want to pr promote this individual, you have a blind spot, they're actually pretty weak, or here's where you screwed up in that interaction. So having the judgment to make a bet on someone, to read the boardroom, to read the organizational leadership, to understand that this person sitting in Manila has the potential that if we move them to corporate in California, they could thrive, is, is almost an immeasurable of immeasurable value. And they then have to have the courage to have the conversation. And so the way we often talk about it is if you have someone in the room who has the best ideas and they're a coward and they're not going to speak up, they're useless. Um, and if you have the opposite problem where you have someone who's constantly speaking up and giving you feedback and chiming in and they have terrible judgment, they're the class clown and you're going to fire them in a, couple, in a year. And so it's that unique combination. And if you think about your heads of HR, if they're one, if they're one of the best, when they're at their best, is when they understand the privileged relationship they enjoy with the, leader team, with the leadership team. It's not just the CEO, it's broader. And they can go in and have conversations that no one else on the leadership team would have the, con the courage to have. And they're right 51% of the time. And I think it also, to add, just to add a bit to that, part of it being a great CHRO is contingent upon having a great CEO. So if you think about uh, your question, what is the, you know, the, the, the most important competency? It's a whole, around the whole talent agenda. If you think, what, what's on the CEO's mind every day? Growth, how do you, how do you grow the, the enterprise? How do you manage risk? How do you, man, how do you ma attract and keep and develop talent? Uh, and how do you deal with disruptive change? Um, so when you put that equation together, the forward-thinking CEO will always put a demand to have a high-priority, strong advisor in their CHRO. So it's not about the competencies or the individual experiences. It's the understanding of the entire um, whole 360 talent agenda 
and, and, and how to bring that to bear as an advisor to the CEO and hence an advisor to the organization as you think about that most one of the top three priorities of a CIO centers around talent. Frankly, it's one of the reasons why we like being in the business we like it we're in because if we want to be in a business where one of the top three priorities um, is, uh, is, is talent, being in the talent business is a good, th a good business to be in. All right, if there are any more, we have time for one last question. Thank you. Just curious, in the examples you gave of uh, world-class CHRO profiles, um, what is the average kind of DNA of their background look like? So are they subject matter experts in all things HR, right? So ER, benefits, comp, to you know, total rewards, talent, or do they come from the business? Do they have a blend of whether it be commercial or marketing or product background? What what have you found, I guess, in those examples you provided, their, their background is? So the, the, of the individuals that I cited, it's a bit of an eclectic mix. Um, there is a shift happening in general in the larger scale world of HR. So if you think that over time, most of the heads of HR of major companies had grown up at Pepsi or GE and to a lesser extent Allied Signal, um, to give you, a, to put a number around it, uh, there are today 251 heads of HR in the Fortune 1000 who grew up at Pepsi. So 25% of the global of the heads of HR of the Fortune 1000 grew up at Pepsi, and most of them under Mike Feiner when he was running HR. Uh, talk about impact of one individual. Um, disproportionately, the Pepsi Academy, if you will, looked at talent from Cornell and the Midwestern Bloc. They liked people who could come in. They had a view that if you could come in and fight a labor union, you could then have the courage to fight a CEO. And so they disproportionately went after um, very athletic, type A, competitive driven graduates of the Cornell ILR program, the Purdue program, the Michigan, Michigan State, <clears throat> kind of the Indiana, that kind of Midwestern stack. GE, which was producing a, a smaller number, but still a 12% you know, of the heads of HR in the Fortune 1000. Um, they looked at similar schools, but they wanted people with a little bit more of a finance acumen who could come in in the audit program and then move into HR. And so the generation that for the last five years has been at the top of the house of HR disproportionately comes from that type of background um, and disproportionately thought of the world, kind of classic training and a great program, but more of an ILR training and both, school, both companies, GE and Pepsi, would move you around, send you to the middle of nowhere to prove that you were tough enough uh, and that you were committed to the company. I mean, there were kind of psychological tests that people were put through. Over the last five years, it has been shifting, and the best young emerging heads of HR disproportionately are coming out of business degrees. Uh, maybe an MBA, but at least an undergrad degree in business, not psychology, which oftentimes, if, you're, if you look at the heads of HR from the last 15 years, if they didn't come from Pepsi, GE, Allied Signal, Honeywell, disproportionately, they had psychology degrees and then moved into HR and climbed up the ranks. Where sh that shift is, has already taken place, where it's now much more coming from the business. Um, we are seeing there is a, an incessant demand uh, that, and the supply is not yet there, but incessant demand to find former McKinsey and you know, business strategy consultants to move into HR. And there are eight or 10 very successful heads of HR who came from that background. But again, eight to 10 versus hundreds that came out of the other systems. Um, we're seeing some very successfully make the move from GM to head of HR, but it's still, you know, I could still measure it, frankly, on one hand. Um, so there, the trend that gets talked about the most today is this idea of moving ahead of HR, um, you know, moving someone from the business into HR. Um, oftentimes, that's a reaction to a very successful head of HR leaving, and the CEO's view is we're not going to be able to replicate that person. They're larger than life. If we promote one of their direct reports or bring in some other head of HR, they're going to feel like a mini-me version. So let me take a trusted business leader and have them do it, and it becomes a Band-Aid. Um, or it is a kind of flip the desk in frustration and say, my HR team is so dysfunctional. We've seen this a few times where my HR organization is dysfunctional. I look at the, at the press and my head of HR is held up as one of the great ones and they're terrible. So if that's what great is, I don't want an HR person anymore. I'm just gonna take someone from the business. And it's done, it's almost a sh kind of shaming of HR. Um, generally speaking, we don't think that that trend has a whole lot of, of uh, you know, uh, energy behind it. Um, what's interesting now, and this is actually even a, a newer phenomenon, is um, as the, new, the kind of this new generation of business trained heads of HR grows, um, we've now seen five heads of HR move to become presidents or CEOs. 
Uh, Dave Pace, the former head of HR from Starbucks, was just named the CEO of Jamba Juice. Uh, David Works, who I referenced, went from Sears to Windstream, was just named president of, of Windstream. Uh, Joe Beresford, John Beresford was just named president of Standard & Poor's. And so we're actually seeing where everyone wants to talk about the need for business leaders to come into HR. That hasn't happened as successfully, but we are seeing the best heads of HR now starting to move on and take over a big piece of the business, which I think is a, is a new phenomenon, that the, but it will continue to grow because the best heads of HR today have the capability to do that. Great. Okay. Well, Good. thank you very much. Good.